Hello everyone, and welcome. This is SEC Fanatic. Um, I hope you all are doing well today, and just thank you for coming on and watching. If you are watching, you can probably tell, and if you're listening, you can probably tell just by seeing um, the kind of stuff behind me or hearing the type of audio, um, the fact that this is a different microphone, that I am on a vacation studio, and I will be in this vacation studio for a few weeks, not quite a month, but a few weeks, just while I'm on vacation and I don't want to stop the podcast because I do enjoy it a little too much, maybe. But I don't want to stop the podcast. But I am on a in a vacation location. <laughs> I'm on a vacation location, and so it'll be like this for just a couple of weeks before I get back to my regular setup. So without further ado, let's get started. But I will say that before before I get started, we're, I'm not slowing down because it's vacation. All right, we have a great great couple of guests. Today we have a former ESPN statistician by the name of Rick Lakin. Uh, next week we will have a doctor out from California. His name is Dr. Tommy John III, and he'll be talking about sports medicine, particularly for youth. And then the week after that we have the Auburn PA announcer. We have a play-by-play -play announcer. We have lots of great guys coming up for you guys. So don't get don't get worried because this is a vacation time. This is a great time for SEC fanatic. But like I said, without further ado, let's get started. There's also, I will note, going to be a giveaway. But I'm going to give details on that after preseason preliminary. Preseason preliminary today is going to be focusing on Kentucky heading into the 2018 college football season. Now, preseason preliminaries where we take a look at one SEC team heading into the college football season. Like I said, this week's is going to be Kentucky. In 2017, they went... 7-6, and 4-4 four and four in the SEC with three losses of three points or less. Now, that's a key thing because but that actually means Kentucky was well within reach of a 10-3 and three team. If you combine the totals, they lost to Florida by one point. They lost to Northwestern in their bowl game by one point and then to Ole Miss by three points. And so they were three games shy of being 10-3, and three, easily could have been. And so that is... Pretty impressive for at least for last year's squad of uh, the Kentucky team. However, I will note that there were blowout losses to Georgia and Louisville that still show that this Kentucky team, even last year when they had a really good team by Kentucky standards, had issues dealing with top tier talent. And that's going to be a big issue for them also heading into the 2018 season. In 2018, they lose their quarterback, Steven Johnson, which is huge and not in a good way for this Kentucky team. But they do get Benny Snell back, and that may be even a bigger piece to be able to get him back. Because having Benny Snell back means that you have Kentucky's number one all-time rushing touchdown scorer. And he's only a junior this year. He has done that in two years. He still has one if he wants to go to the NFL next year, or two even years left to be running back for Kentucky. So Benny Snell is great as far as optimism for the Kentucky team. Ride on this Benny Snell wave, at least for this year while you have him, because he will be a great asset for this Kentucky team. You have an offensive line to back him up with four out of five people who have started at some point in the season returning back. So this running game is really looking good. Your questions come at wide receivers. You only get three wide receivers that are coming back, and you have a new wide receivers coach. How is this wide receiver coach going to develop the team? How are these wide receivers going to do in with only three returning starters? Who's going to step up? These are the big questions for Kentucky's receiving core. As far as people who could be the quarterback candidate replacing Steven Johnson, there are two sophomores who are leading this race. There is Terry Wilson, who's a 6'3", 205 dual-thread quarterback, and then there's Gunnar Hoke, who is a 6'3", 206 pound quarterback who mainly more so focuses on throwing which is what the Kentucky's coaches are more used to is the air raid style throw it kind of style offense or you have the dual threat quarterback which is more like what Steven Johnson provided your ability to run both with the quarterback and with um, Benny Snell so there's an interesting dynamic there and that'll be an interesting race to watch for Kentucky fans 
Defense has athletes, but they are not proven against top talent like we were talking about. They have a, they had a great run defense last year for Kentucky. Actually, they, they their run defense was not bad at all. But their pass defense gave up big yardage. And so, really, Kentucky's questions are as the things that are going to make Kentucky successful is everything that we expect them to be good at, running defense, running offense, to stay that way, and then how can they step up in the running, or not running, my bad, how can they step up in the passing offense, how are these receivers going to do, and then also how can you step up in the area of passing defense as well, not giving up chunk yardage. So these are going to be the big questions for Kentucky heading into the 2018 season. As far as season predictions, I'm going to be using mm -hmm, seccountry.com, and they predict them to go 7-5. and five. Kentucky will be trying to snap the 31-year straight losing streak to Florida. And if they can do that, and win all these other games like, like is predicted, then they will have 18 wins, which hasn't happened, <laughs> not 18. Not 18 wins, my bad. Not 18 wins. They will have 8 wins, which has not happened since 1984. So, maybe not championship hopes for Kentucky, but definitely hope in there for some things that haven't happened in a while. Beating Florida, getting to 8 wins, and definitely, of course, always wanting to get to a bowl game. They did it last year, and you want to see steps taken. So, this Kentucky squad, hoping to improve, hoping to get better than last year's team. Of course, who isn't in the SEC? <laughs> Alright, so good luck to Kentucky. Next up, I was talking about a giveaway earlier, so let me bring back the details to you all on that right now. The giveaway, is our first giveaway, is going to be what's inside this box. Alright, I got this on Amazon, I will say, and the box for some reason is a little... A little messed up but the contents inside are not i did i did check that and so what do you get inside the monks you get paperwork you get what you care for which is a i have written down the official the official uh whatever it is it is a officially a 247 viz led headlamp with a motion sensor so if that interests you if you are a hiker uh, someone who likes to do w night walking. If you... Night walking? Yes, if you like night walking, walking at night, and you would like to see while you walk at night. If you are a sleepwalker and you would like to, and your sleeping self would like to see in front of you so that you don't run into walls, then get this. Apply for the, uh, for the giveaway. It's completely free to you. It is a headlamp, which is useful to some of you. And it's free, so why not? Then of course, three AAA batteries come with, so that you can actually power this headlamp. If that interests you, details are about to come up in three, two, one. Once the box is closed, that box will not be opened again until it is shipped to you, the winner. Again, details on that. How you can win that? You can win it by emailing secsportsfanatic@gmail.com with the subject line. Giveaway again, SEC Sports Fanatic at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway, or you can like, comment, or share any SEC Fanatic post on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, and you will be entered into that. Submissions will be closing August 1st, and it will be announced the podcast after that. I think August 1st is a Wednesday. And so the winner will be announced on that podcast the next Thursday. So you have until August 1st to enter into the giveaway of this headlamp. As far as email goes, you can also sign up for something that we're starting, which is, an e which is an, a weekly email newsletter, and that will come to you with the podcast. That will come to you uh, with the podcast if you sign up for it. You get if you if you sign up for the newsletter, you get show notes, you get personal links to the show. You get show commentary from me, and you also get priority in the giveaway contests. So what that means is if you want whatever's being given away and you're on the email newsletter, then you're going to be put first on the list for being on this email newsletter above the other people who aren't, if that makes sense. 
So there are uh, lots of benefits if you want an insider look into SEC Fanatic by signing up for this email newsletter. And all you have to do is send us an email saying that you want to be signed up. So again, a quick reminder that you, one, one last reminder, that you have the chance to vote for the player of the year for SEC Fanatic, as well as the weekly crazy sport. You can go to the Google form below, or I'll probably put up somewhere here in the corner a little I information dot, if you're watching the YouTube version. If you go to the Google form, then you get to write in whoever you want to be the SEC player of the year from any sport, from any team inside the SEC. Now, if you are clicking this little I button thing that's appearing somewhere up here, then you, then th those are my suggestions. Um, so you may not have full range if you just click it on the YouTube version. Y going down to the Google Forms will give you a better chance to express your own personal feelings as to who you think is the SEC Fanatic Player of the Year. But I get that some of you may not want to do that, and you may just want to do the clickety-click thing. And so the clickety-click thing's up here, if that interests you. Okay, so next up, we have former uh, ESPN statistician. His name is Rick Lakin. So he's going to take you guys inside the broadcast booth for what happens as far as stats goes, and how stats are recorded, how stats are given to the announcers. I think some of it may interest you guys, and also he has a new book coming out called Brilliant. So we talked about all of this. I hope you guys like the interview. Here's Mr. Rick Lakin. We are here with Rick Lakin. He has over 30 years of experience uh, in working for sports television. He's also a best-selling author. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you, Matthew, for having me on SCC Fanatic. And thank you for coming on. So. Let's talk a little bit about your career. Um, so who all have you worked for? I've worked for the major networks, NBC, ABC, ESPN, and CBS, all in the San Diego area, at either at University of San Diego or at San Diego State University. In addition, I have also worked uh, for the regional networks, the old Mountain Network for the Mountain West and uh, CBS Sports Network and the old Prime Ticket out of uh, Southern California. Okay, so what exactly did you do? Like, what, what, what was your job? I had one of two jobs. Either I was official stats where I sat in the room with the college people who recorded stats to check official yard lines and things like that or what I'll talk about the most is I sat next to the play-by-play -play announcer so you had a two-man booth and the play-by-play -play announcer stands on the left and I am to his left and then the color commentator or analyst sits to his right and what I would do is watch the stats monitor provided by the school or off the web that provided the live stats as as the plays occurred and then what I had in my hand was a mini whiteboard if you think back to the 2000 election Tim Russert made it famous by writing the words Florida 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 on it and showing it to the national audience. So I use this mini whiteboard and when I pick up an important stat, I'll put it on the whiteboard, hold it in front of the play-by-play -play announcer and he works it in. So you're just kind of like the assistant to the play-by-play -play announcers, just kind of giving them help on what to say and important information? Trying to make him sound more intelligent. So you are the intelligence of the play-by-play -play announcer. You're the brains behind them. Yeah, that's pretty much it. In addition, then I also feed the truck because I've, I'm telling, I'm listening to what the announcers are saying, and I'm trying to work with the truck to get their graphic presentation good. And something that I did, I don't know if others did it, but I called it a coordinated stats. Let's say we went to break and there's important statistic that I want to get out that they will build in the truck and show on the lower third. 
Now I won't, usually the announcers or sometimes they don't like to read graphics off the air. So what I would do is giving, give them a side stat that would amplify what was on the screen. For example, the runner goes eight carries for 84 yards and I would give him that he's currently five for 42 on this drive. And that way the truck looks smart, the announcer looks smart, and I just sit there smiling. So in addition to you making the announcer look uh, smart, how do you feel that your job and what you did benefited the announcers and the viewers overall? Well, the idea of sports television is to convey a lot of information. The announcer conveys what's going on in the game. The analyst conveys the nuts and bolts of the game and background information. And I fill in the numbers. Sports fanatics, like your fans, love numbers. And that's the kind of information that I uh, provided to the announcer and to the truck for them to put up graphics. I'll give you an example. One time I did an NFL game and I was assigned inside the graphics truck because it was an NFL game involving the Chargers and the Cowboys and it was the national game on Fox. Pat Summerall and, and uh, uh, the coach were, were up in the booth, John Madden. And I was specifically assigned to do first down stats. Got to be the third quarter and I said, hey, graphics guys, I've got a stat for you. When Dallas passes on first down, they gain 11. When they run, they lose 1.6. So they built this graphic and this was in about, two, about 90, 1996 after Dallas won the Super Bowl. John Madden looks at that graphic and he says, there you see the Chargers defense is keying on first on the run on first down. The graphics said that the runner was going to lose two yards, and Emmett Smith, the greatest runner in the NFL history, lost two yards, and we put it up on the screen and predicted it. Oh wow, that was that's my best stat story. So, what did you enjoy most about the job? When I was in the Navy, I was a nuclear reactor operator. When I was a teacher, I taught math and, math and video productions. And I was a weekend warrior for television. When the ball is kicked off until the end of the game, my mind is totally focused on statistics. And I really enjoyed the opportunity to focus on that one thing for a period of time. That's what I most enjoyed. Plus the basic idea of getting into the game free. <laughs> That's always a good benefit to it. So what impact do you think, or what impact do you feel like sports or television has on the sports world? Let's go back a little bit in history and focus on NCAA basketball. Since 1939, there have been 80 NCAA basketball championships. And before 1990, let me give you a list of schools that also won the NCAA. 1943 Wyoming, 1944 Utah, 47 Holy Cross, 1950 CCNY. CCNY doesn't even play Division I anymore. They're D3. Oh, wow. 1954 LaSalle, 1955 and 1956 San Francisco. That was Bill Russell's. And then 61 and 62, Cincinnati broke our Buckeyes hearts and beat us twice in a row. In 1963, Loyola up, upset Cincinnati and, and they're back in the final four this year as well. 1966, uh, they took the African-American players and UTEP to the national championship and beat you uh, beat Kentucky and then Jerry Tarkanian in 1990. Since 1990, no mid-major school has won the NCAA championship. 
That's television, that's money and exposure provided by primarily ESPN and since then the Fox Networks, FS1, and CBS Sports. Those schools provide major exposure to the major conferences, the, the, the Power Five conferences and the Big East. And they provide contractually one or two games a year to all the other schools. So money and exposure has been the primary factor. And in all, almost all sports, except maybe the NFL to a lesser extent, it has destroyed the level playing field. In baseball, you have large markets, large market teams which have large local television contracts uh, versus the small market teams and the large market teams win more national championships. In the NBA, what have we had? San Francisco and Cleveland for the last four or five years. Big, big school, big economy teams. Maybe not so much there. But uh, now in hockey, look at the idea that the Canadian team hasn't won it in many years. So money and exposure. The other thing is modifying the game to either speed it up or structure it so they can get TV commercials in. This is why soccer will never be a major television sports because you've got two 45 minute segments where they can't show a full commercial. So you're saying that it's not necessarily all positive. Some of the TV coverage is kind of taken away from some of the smaller schools? Well, absolutely. Um, you're, you're SEC, so you're gifted with working with the big market schools the, uh, in, the, in the Power Five Conference. And your fans are gifted with, um, you know, with great games every week on all the television networks. Whereas if you're talking about some of the other schools like Grambling, they get two or three TV games a year, uh, except maybe some local TV. In other words, the fans of the lesser mid-market, mid-major mid schools don't get as much TV exposure. They don't get a chance at a national championship in football or basketball and and sometimes they're in baseball but in other words if you're an SEC fan it's great for you if you're a AAC or Conference USA or Mid-American Conference not so much um, going going back to your career um, if someone else wanted to get into the sports broadcasting world or if someone else wanted to become sports statistician what's the path that they should take to be able to do that? Go up the stairs to a high school game to the press box, sit next to the announcer and say, can I take stats for you? Get started, learn, learn how to keep stats properly, learn how to report properly. Eventually you'll go to college, you'll, you'll go to the uh, sports information, the media office and say, hey, I do stats, can I join your crew? And also, not so much in Southern California, but say in Columbus, Ohio, you go to some high school guy that's doing radio and you a volunteer to do stats. The key, the key point is be professional, number one. And number two, never always say yes. 90% of success is saying yes. And I've, let, me, um, let me add to that. Let me add to that. I've got some websites available and I sent it to you as a slide. Yeah, and I'll put that up on, on my video. site, iCrewDigital.com. Click on sports statistics. Now, all of the colleges, most of them, use StatBroadcast.com, which is a, a system by which the college statistician types in the game. He touch types the play-by-play. -play. And then Stat Broadcast creates a website for the media and fans that contains all the information. If you want to learn about statistics, Google NCAA statistics publications and sports rule books. And 
you can download PDFs of the meet, of these stat manuals that can teach you how to do it. Go to your college, your favorite college, and download their athletic media guides. They're free and they have immense statistics and shows you what's the important. But most of all, never say no and volunteer to do it for free. Kind of almost like an internship. It's an internship, but it is... There aren't a lot of people that want to do sports statistics. I mean, I, I was a nerd. I love to do it. Um, and it's a wide open field. And if you go up to somebody who's in the media, say yes, they'll never turn you down. They'll always give you the opportunity. And it's, it's very easy to work your way up to, uh, to local television, local radio, and then regional networks, and then um, get your foot in the door nationally. And it's a great part-time job. Yeah, that sounds like a really fun part-time job too. So let's switch gears a little bit um, to your book that you wrote. Um, it was a, uh, as I have written down here, it was a top 100 children's science fiction book uh, called Brilliant. So what exactly is, is this book about? I was a publisher of 35 books for other authors and we never really sold very many. And I figured I'll give it a try myself. Do you remember Return of the Jedi? Have you ever seen that movie? It's one of the Star Wars movies. Oh yes, it's one of my favorite. Remember the opening opening part of the movie where they had a, uh, a spaceship or a vehicle on the desert? That vehicle, that wooden mock-up, was built in the Imperial Sand Dunes near Yuma, California. Oh, okay. So think of that. And then you think of a starship that gets caught in a time loop and goes back 200 years and they have to go to Earth to get lunch and they happen to be flying over the desert and they see this spaceship on the in the sand hmm. and they land next to it and they find out it's a bunch of guys making a movie. That's my basic premise. And then you flash forward a few years to the when the young character is born, Jennifer, who has a 206 IQ, she gets a Hollywood internship and she's searching for her father. And she knows that the key to learning about him is at Tovar Studios where they make Star Cruiser Brilliant. And she also finds out that Brilliant flies into space. And it's a fun book. It's a fun read. It's targeted towards kids. There's no profanity. Um, there's a lot of different flashbacks to earlier times for the older folks like me who like uh, references to older things and um, I've, I had a lot of fun writing it and it's done fairly well it surprised the heck out of me that now I wouldn't consider myself a best-selling author except that this book for for the last 40 or 50 days has been in the top 100 on the Amazon children's science fiction genre and they call that a best-selling list bestseller list and I'm not going to disagree with Amazon. If you're a bestseller, you're a bestseller. <laughs> it's, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to pay any bills with How do you hope that the book will impact people? My target audience was a 12 year old girl who's kind of a geek, who's looking, trying to find herself and I'm trying to give her characters that are just like her, that were successful, who who use their knowledge for power and are successful in a man's world. Now it's not just for girls, but it's got guys too. And that's who I am trying to sell the book to. Hopefully some girl will find it, find herself in the book. And that's what everybody does when they read. They find themselves in a book and see themselves as a successful character. So maybe there is someone out there who would be interested in picking that up. Um, where are the places that they can go to get that? Do a Google search or Amazon search for Brilliant 
by Rick Lakin, L-A-K-I-N. And you will find both the paperback for $15 and the ebook for $2.99. And you can also, if you have Kindle Unlimited, which is kind of Netflix for books, you can download the book and then I get a little feed, a little money back for each page that you read. And and actually that's that's been my the best part of my sales is Kindle Unlimited. All right. So if someone out here is interested in kind of doing the same thing and becoming an author or writing their own book, just real quick, what are some simple steps to get started on that? When I got into the doldrums, I had written Like a House of Fire, I set a, a reminder to write 500 words a day, which takes about a half hour, 45 minutes. If you write 500 words a day for 100 days, you're going to have 50 or 60,000 words, and that's a novel. Now that's the first step. You've got a manuscript. Let others read and comment. You need feedback. You can't write in a vacuum. Find an, a good editor and pay him. Find a good cover and marketing. And once you have a cover and a manuscript, you know how much it costs to publish on Amazon? It costs zero dollars. So it, at whatever point that you stop, you can still publish your book your family legacy, advice for others, a success book if you're a businessman to hand out with your business card. Amazon gives it, publishes it for free and then you pay $2 for a 100 page book or $6 for a 400 page book like mine plus shipping and they'll send you paperbacks and you're set to go. Now, if you want to take the next step and be a successful marketed author, you got to go into marketing and quality and a lot of other issues. Well, all right. Again, that was Rick Lakin. All right. So thank you again for uh, coming out here today. And I'd like to, I'd like to have you on again sometime. I, I will be glad to do that. And if readers want to find me, I'm at, my email is R-I-L-A-K-I-N. R-I-L-A-K-I-N at gmail.com and my website is iCrewDigital.com or my author website is RickLakin.com. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you, Rick. Okay, so this week's Crazy Sport voted on by you guys is Handball. It is played by trying to get an inflated ball into the opponent's net at the end of a Sorry, I just popped my finger. That's what that little snap was. It wasn't my bone breaking. It was just my ligament popping. <laughs> so anyway, you're trying to get this yellow inflatable ball into an opponent's goal at the other end. It's played in two teams of 7 to 11 players in two halves of about 30 minutes with an intermission in between. The catch is that you can only play it and you can only hit it with above the with any body part above the knees so think about it as reverse soccer or as every other country but america calls it football think of it as football but it's the opposite it's handball instead of not being able to use your hands you're not allowed to use your feet that's essentially what it is again you can vote on more crazy sports by going to the google form below or by clicking the information tabs up here if you're watching the youtube video Thank you guys for watching, but don't click away yet because the credits hold a special surprise for you all, especially those of you who want a heads up in the giveaway contest. Just a little hint, maybe you want to listen to the credits. All right, thank you guys. This has been SEC Fanatic. Thank you for watching slash listening to the end. You are what makes this show worth it. Your host has been Matthew Johnson. Our guest has been Rick Lakin. The song of the week is drums and percussion royalty free. No copyright is held for any still pictures, motion graphics, or music. If you have any improvements you would like to suggest, you can make them at any of our social media places. Facebook, search SEC Fanatic. Twitter, at Fanatic SEC. Or Instagram, at SEC underscore Fanatic. You can also contact us at secsportsfanatic at gmail.com. If you liked what you heard, there's more. You can listen on YouTube, SoundCloud, or iTunes. Links are in the description. 
As a reward for listening, if you email us at secsportsfanatic at gmail.com with the subject line PRIZE99, you will be first on the list to win the giveaway. Again, the subject line is PRIZE99. Email us at secsportsfanatic at gmail.com. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your time. This has been SEC Fanatic.